I've given you an example from England, which I'm guessing probably no one in this room other than me has ever been to this site. Some of you might have been to England, but I think I'm probably the only person that's been to this site. And I wanted you to think about your knowledge and how you think about your local context and how you then apply your knowledge to a different site. So part of this was to take you out of your comfort zone. And the reason for doing that is that sometimes... When we look at our own sites and sites that we're used to working on, we see certain things, but we don't see everything because we're used to looking at a site in a certain way. And if you start looking at different wetlands, you have to reapply your knowledge. And so, for instance, looking at some of the provisioning services, if you don't understand the social context or the environmental context or the political or economic context, you won't necessarily identify the right services. So, for instance, in the UK, we can't grow rice. It's too cold in the winter for us to grow rice. So people who might think a provisioning service for a wetland would be rice production, that wouldn't work in this context. Equally, this is a tidal system, and it is very difficult to grow rice and get good yields and good crop production where you have salt water coming into them. In terms of fisheries and as a provisioning service, the site itself probably doesn't actually provide food for eating because that isn't part of the culture of this area. But what it does do is the site acts very much as a nursery for fish. And monitoring of fish populations, I've already shown, fish populations in the river and the estuary are increasing because there's greater opportunity for the young fish to use this as a nursery area, which wasn't there before. So there is a link to fisheries, but it's an indirect link. In terms of other agricultural production, one of the big challenges here is the people that used to own the land, who farm the land, they no longer own or farm that land. So they have been a victim. To them, if you think back to the earlier slides about the farmer, they were maximising food production. They've now lost that. So when negotiating and designing and understanding the system, you need to explain this to certain stakeholders because they will be victims. In terms of the regulating services, there's a whole range of regulating services this site provides, not least in terms of regulating flows of water, um, regulating the local climate, but also, it's gone from being a freshwater system that was heavily drained. They wanted to keep the water off it so they could grow crops. And what you would get in that system would be, uh, in the ditches, you would get stagnant water, you'd get lots of mosquitoes, and it would be very, and you, if you went to this area in the summer, it would be very unpleasant because there'd be lots of pests and nuisance species. But equally, the soil would be really dry. So there'd be no organic material building up in the soil. You go there now, and because the site is flooded twice a day with the tides, you can already see the organic material building up. So it's already sequestering carbon and storing carbon. And coastal salt marshes and mudflats are very important for storing carbon. And there's virtually no mosquitoes. So... By reflooding it, you've improved a couple of regulating services. In terms of the cultural services, the area now attracts somewhere around about 50,000 people a year that go down there for bird watching, there are footpaths, which is great unless you live in those small houses up in the top left hand corner. And the people that live there moved there because they wanted to be isolated. And they now feel like they're victims because. The one road which runs down, you can just see it on the far left-hand side of the screen, they find that road full of parked cars. So they can't get to their houses anymore because one service which wasn't there before in terms of recreation, in terms of aesthetics, bird watching, that service is now really important for 50,000 people who go there regularly. But the local people, the 20 or so people that live there, now feel like they're victims 
because they can't get out of their village. So again, it's trying to understand this balance of different services. But in terms of the supporting services, the site is providing a lot more water recycling, a lot more nutrient recycling because of the exchange with the tidal water, a lot more primary productivity, much greater biodiversity in terms of the variety of species and animals that are visiting the site. And so one of the challenges here is not just un in terms of understanding what it's currently doing, but to look at the differences between before and after. And I've been working on this site for a number of years with a, a university in Japan where we've been looking at the, the risks and the perception of risk in terms of this sort of coastal wetland uh, restoration. Um, what we're finding is that if you don't engage with people, you will get victims and you will get beneficiaries. And with very little additional design at the very early stage, if people had thought about the values that people had, the, the design would be slightly different. And you probably could have balanced some of those victims in a much better way if you've been thinking about the ecosystem services. So some of the lessons to come out of this isn't so much whether you've got a yes or a no or a right or a wrong. It's to get you thinking that you've got to take your knowledge and apply it in different contexts. Maybe at your site, but your site might change in time. You might get different governments who have a different perception. Environmental changes, climate change for instance, might change your perception of your ecosystem services at your site. But equally, if you're making management decisions about a wetland, if you don't engage stakeholders appropriately and understand which services they're going to benefit from and which ones they might lose through a change in management, and this was a radical change in management, going from a freshwater system which was enclosed and heavily farmed to a saltwater system that is basically left to, for nature to flood it, if you make a management change, there will be people that will see certain values increase and certain values decrease. So the real lessons here aren't whether you've got yes or no, it's to get you starting to think about the context. Does anyone have any other questions they wanted to raise? I, the reason I use this, because I tried to use an example which would be well away from Asia. Because if I use an example from Asia, it's much easier for you to think, oh, it's, that's similar to my site. So were there any other questions that people wanted to... Uh, to, to raise on that. Right, either everyone's asleep or everything was fine. Okay, so we've had our coffee. So we'll go back to Dubai, to the wonderful Ras Al Khor. And so what we, we were looking at before was a qualitative assessment. And you can start quantifying some of these assessments. So the assessment you just did based on that photograph from England was a qualitative, it was a yes, no. But you can move from a qualitative to a quantitative assessment quite quickly using information which is readily available, talking to stakeholders, talking to your colleagues, even information you have in your own heads. And so for instance, for Ras Al Khor, we could talk about how many degrees centigrade is the climate called by? How many people visit this site? How many people visit every year? What are your numbers of wintering birds? How much sediment is being deposited? How many pollinators, or do they support local agriculture or nurseries? And you can collect information like this relatively easily. You don't need a long, detailed study, but you can start quantifying many of the services quite simply. And then that can give you a, a quantitative assessment, which is maybe one step up from a qualitative assessment, and it might make, allow you to address a specific issue, and quite often it involves transferring knowledge from other sites that you're aware of, other, other studies, maybe talking to stakeholders, doing some stakeholder engagement. And you might want to use published data or site observations. You might actually go out and monitor things. So it, it can need a bit more data. Some of that might be comparative data. And you might need to collect original data. But you can move from a qualitative assessment once you've done that first to a quantitative assessment relatively easily. One of the challenges is how do you quantify? And 
you could say, well, OK, we will go there and we'll count the number of people using the hides and the walkways. And there's different ways we could do that. And at this site in Dubai, some of the approaches they can look at is how many people come every year. So what is the annual total number of people that visit this wetland? Well, you could achieve that by counting up how many tickets are sold when people go to the site. And you can say, OK, well, the total number of people visiting, we know we, we give everyone a ticket. Every day we count up the number of tickets. Every year we've got whatever thousand people. But it might be that the wardens actually say, but not everyone gets a ticket. We get some people that come in through other access points and they just walk around, do a bit of bird watching and go home. So you might want to count people that the site managers and the wardens have seen on site, which might give you a different figure to the people with the tickets. Or it might be you say, well, actually, because we're not sure, we're going to go out at certain times of the year and we're going to count everyone on the site on these days and we're going to estimate based on maybe doing two counts every month, so 24 counts every year, that will multiply that up to give us an annual figure. Or you might say, well, actually, why do we need to do this? We counted people five years ago. We can use those figures. Now, the challenge comes, you can use four different ways and end up with four different answers in terms of the number of people that visit the site. They'll all be right, but they'll also all be wrong. It's just different ways of estimating the same thing. Or you could actually say, well, I'm not going to bother doing that. I'm just going to go to a nearby site, and I know that site has about that many people. Our site is similar. You couldn't do that in Dubai because there isn't another site, but somewhere else you could. And you could say, well, I think it'll be about the same. And the challenge comes is if you take one of these approaches and you say, well, that site has 4,823 visitors every year, that's a very accurate number, but it's wrong. Because you might estimate that another way and get 5,220 people. You might estimate it another way and you might get 10,000. So trying to quantify some of these things can be simple, but you've got to be aware of all the assumptions and the controls on that. And so rather than just saying, well, our site is visited by X number, you have to explain that figure and understand the rationale behind it. And that could be the same for all the other ways you can quantify different services. So sometimes it's, there's a need to quantify, but you must think about the assumptions and the methods you've used to quantify and think, well, actually, there might be alternative ways to do this. None of them are necessarily wrong or right. It's just if you don't explain your method, then someone might come along and come up with a very different figure from you because they've used a very different method. And that's the same when you try and quantify anything. It'd be the same if you're counting birds. If you went out once a year and estimated your annual figures on one day and you've got a migratory site, you could be completely out. So it's the same, but you sometimes have to think about how you're going to collect the data what information you're using, and then what the assumptions are. And as an example, this is um, quite a common example. Nowadays, people are very, very interested in coastal wetlands, well, all wetlands. Now they've been written into the Paris Climate Change Agreement in terms of countries meeting their targets for greenhouse gas emission. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and their latest report now has wetlands in it. And wetlands are seen as really crucial, whereas a few years ago it was only forests, now it's wetlands as well, in terms of carbon storage. And so there's a real move to say wetlands are important because they store carbon. And we know this sort of tidal flat system, high productive system, a lot of organic material, you get good accumulation of carbon. And just as an example, it shows some of the problems and challenges in this is you could look at the total amount of carbon stored in a wetland. Now, what you might want to do is estimate how much carbon is in the litter, the deadwood, above ground, below ground, and you could estimate that maybe on a per hectare basis. Or you might say, well, we know for this type of habitat, for salt marsh or for seagrass or for tidal flat or mangrove, 
we've got estimates that we could use and we can take those estimates from a report or from a publication. We know how much we've got in our area. We can quantify that and come up with a figure. So in the IPCC reports, there's good quantification and good figures. The challenge is, and this is a bit difficult to read, but these are the carbon stocks, the figures in the latest IPCC report, which give you the carbon figures for mangroves, tidal marshes, seagrass, and these are in um, metric ton, um, yeah, in tons, <coughs> metric tons. So what you'll see is for tidal marsh, there is a range of figures. So if, it, if you've got tidal marsh, it could be between 221 tons of carbon per hectare or 579. It's more than double. So if you choose the lower figure, you could be underestimating. If you choose the higher figure, you could be overestimating. If you're looking at mineral soils rather than organic soils, the figure's between 15.6 and 623, more than a an order of magnitude difference. And likewise, if you're looking at um, a mixture of soils. So again, if you're using published information, you've got to understand the provenance of it, you've got to understand what it actually means. And the reason why this is important is that you could be explaining a value in a way which is very, very different if you use maybe a lower figure or a higher figure. But the real challenge comes is when people turn around and go, well, that's great, I know my wetland stores carbon. You're telling me I've got, an, I've got a mineral soil, so my tidal marsh is so many hectares, it could be storing between this figure and this figure of carbon. That's great. But you end up getting reports that say, well, my wetland is worth $91.6 million a year. Yes. Very That's fine. Uh, I have one doubt. Uh, can we correlate? Uh, Thanks, sir. Excuse me. Uh, can we correlate the value of uh, suppose wetland ecosystem and equivalent variation of wetland ecosystem? Suppose in the previous slides, as you showed that uh, uh, we can count the number of tourists something visited the park or something wetland, say wetland, and uh, some few. A few articles which I went through, like uh, we use methods like hydraulic pricing method, yeah. travel cost method, you know, environment method, something. So can we correlate different coordinate uh, this uh, two system uh, two variation or uh, equivalent variation of wetland and the way uh, value of wet system? Mm -hmm. Can we correlate that one? Yeah. I'll use that one. Thanks. So what you're saying is you can have the, the value of an individual ecosystem service or you can have the value of the wetland, the, the total value of a wetland. And so if you're looking, let's say, at tourism, you could use ways of saying willingness to pay. How much does a tourist willing to pay? If we have 10,000 tourists, each tourist is willing to pay $5 to come to my site. That's, that wetland is worth 50000 for tourism. So you can do that, or you could say, okay, well, tourism is one value, and from the exercise you've done, looking at the couple of other sites, there might be many values. So you might say, well, that wetland is also storing carbon, and therefore we can use these figures. There's a global price for mar uh, carbon price. You could say, well, we have this area. The price for carbon, the value of carbon is this, so we add that to the tourism value, and you can sum these values. You can do that. I would say you shouldn't do that for two reasons, and I'll explain one. This was a study that was done in uh, Myanmar, uh, at Mwinji, which is uh, the first Ramsar site in Myanmar. And it said the carbon value was that, 92 million. $92 million. Now, we've just seen that was based on these sort of figures. They chose the upper values because they wanted to tell the government this site is very important. The bigger the money, the more importance. That's the simple logic. So they used similar figures, but they used the upper estimates rather than the lower estimates. In the report, to be fair, 
they have said there is caution. But they still use that as the headline in the summary, in the executive summary. That's the figure you see. Um, they then looked at a whole load of other services, but not the full suite of services, so a subset of services, which again, they said, these aren't all the benefits of wetland providers, it's just some, they added them all together. The problem comes is that, first of all, when you add them, in economic terms, you're double counting, because the carbon sequestration is to do with the habitat type, the habitat type is to do with the aesthetics of it, the aesthetics of it is why people go there. So all these things, you're double counting. So from an economic point of view, that to add some of these values doesn't make sense because you are double, you're using the same value more than once. The other thing is when you put a figure like that, even if that figure was right, oops, was right carbon market changes. So that's going to be right at one moment in time and then wrong the rest of the time. And it's actually going to be wrong more than it's ever going to be right. Likewise, when you start looking at all these values, society changes, financial systems change, societal preferences change. Um, as I said, 25 years ago when I first started working on wetlands, no one was restoring wetlands for carbon. I remember having a conversation in the UK and in Europe with a whole load of government agencies saying you should be looking at wetlands for carbon storage. No one was interested. It wasn't on the agenda. It is today. And so having these figures is useful, but I think what is more important is understanding the assumptions behind them and explaining those. And so I always say really have caution. And if, if someone is putting pressure on you, a government or a stakeholder to say, I want to know how much that wetland is worth. I always, my standard answer, and I don't know if this will translate into everyone's language, but it is an underestimation of infinity. So a wetland is worth something between zero and infinity, but it's probably just a little bit below infinity. And they said, well, how much is that? I said, well, it's a little bit less than infinity. It's a meaningless number, basically. So... I'll come back to, to Moinji because we'll do an exercise on it. So really, I think the take-home message is here is that it is challenging to quantify a lot of these services. When you are only looking at a subset of services as well, it comes back to that bear's paw print that I showed earlier on about the impoundment area. If you're only valuing in terms of quantification and then monetary value a small subset, that isn't the full value. In some ways, I think the challenge for wetland managers isn't to go down the route of becoming economists, because if we all became economists, our wetlands would just disappear. The challenge for us is to become better at communicating about value and using different language to communicate value and to be able to look at the full range of values and linking the value to the beneficiary. Now, Mwinji in um, Myanmar, I've... So I've been working there two, three years now. $92 million, I can tell you that no one in the local community gets $92 million. The government doesn't get $92 million. So who gets that money? You have a value, but who gets that money? No one gets that money. It's not like, oh, here's a wetland, we're going to get rid of the wetland and everyone can get a bit of the $92 million. That's not going to happen. So having these economic values can be useful for some audiences, without a doubt, but quite often they're completely meaningless values that are never going to be used. Yeah, sure. Sorry. I'm very sorry. No, no, please. Uh, uh, one of the agriculture options in my country, yeah. I went to his uh, uh, He has uh, uh, the monetary value, not economic valuation of the wetland in the sense, uh, he has uh, value, uh, he has done the economic valuation of water resources yeah. in terms of very field. So he has used uh, variance, uh, variance method mm -hmm. and variance pricing method uh, to find the value of water. Yeah. So he has published and I read to that one. So what do you say that uh, is it uh, 
Good, uh, we have uh, to demand that the water mm-hmm. or should not uh, inspire. Yeah. I would say for certain audiences, having that monetary value can be quite important. For other audiences, it will mean nothing. So I think you have to choose, with any form of communication, you choose the right message for the right audience. So if you were to go to talk to local stakeholders who live around that wetland and you told them that one figure, it would mean nothing to them. But if you said that... uh, there are so many wells that they can use. Is the battery gone? Battery's gone. There are so many wells they can use. There's water available all year round. Um, and how it would benefit them in terms of it's clean water, their health will be improved. That's using a different message, but it's saying the same thing. So you have to change the message for the audience. And I think... One of the things that's happened over the last 15 years or so is not just in wetlands but in other ecosystems, a lot of people from the conservation movement have tried to come up with these magic numbers with the misdirected view that if you tell a government this wetland is worth a big, big number, they will protect it. They won't. They'll just come and find another value which is bigger than that. They'll say, oh, but our hotel is going to be worth 100 million. So we'll put a hotel here instead, because that's only worth 92 million. And that's the, you get into that game and you get beaten. So I think we have to get better at talking about value in the broader sense and how humans value things than talking about money as a single value. And that's the challenge for all of us. Right. What we're going to do now is we're going to have another practical exercise. So, this is, a, another, this is the same site, this is Mawinji, which you already know stores carbon because the report said it's worth $91.6 million. This is a Ramsar site in uh, Myanmar, and you have a, an assessment sheet, handout number two, which should look like this on your desks. And what we've got here is I've given you a list of ecosystem services. And what I'd like you to do, again, in your small groups, is to go down that list and based on the very limited evidence of these four photographs. Now, I'll give you some more background to the site. The site is a large freshwater reservoir. Um, It traditionally was built as an irrigation reservoir to allow downstream Uh, rice paddies to be irrigated, but also to regulate the flow of water to the downstream river, which was a major route used for transporting timber down down the river. So it was set up as an irrigation reservoir to irrigate both the river and rice paddy downstream. It became a Ramsar site in 2004. It has a whole range of livelihoods, including collecting lotus stems for making uh, fibre. A lot of fisheries, cultural importance. There's a small education centre. And those of you that might recognise the former Deputy Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention, Nick Davidson, visiting the education centre. There are recreation facilities, including uh, for tourists, including restaurants and accommodation. It attracts over 10,000, sorry, over 20,000 water birds a year. And there are a whole range of other services that it provides to the local communities living around the site. Based on those four photographs and your knowledge of similar sort of lake or similar wetland systems in Asia, and start thinking about whether those lists of services are high, medium or low. And I just want you to have a discussion. Now, the, the absolute, whether you put it as low or medium or high, to me is less important. But I want you to start thinking about what evidence would you use to say, oh, that's high. Why would something be high as to being something being low? So it's more to get you thinking about the different magnitude, different importance of services. What is it that makes one thing more important than another? And so what I'd like you to do is, 
maybe choose a few from each of the sections, from the provisioning, the regulating, the cultural and the supporting, and just think, well, why would I put that one as high and that one as low? Or it might be, just based on those photographs, you're thinking, well, I don't actually know. So there's a column with a question mark. And th if there are some that you think, well, I don't know from that photograph, why? What extra information do you think you would need to be able to do that? Because the challenge is that you can apply your knowledge, but sometimes you have to make a value judgment as something is, we talked about it with Armet, something is low, medium or high, or whether you actually just don't know. So that's what I'd like you to do for the next sort of 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, is to, in your groups, go down that sheet, looking at those pictures and choosing a few services from each of the categories and just having a discussion amongst yourself about, well, it says food production as a provisioning service, let's say rice, is that important or is it not important? Is it high, is it medium, low, or do you need more information? And just have a discussion. And the whole idea of this isn't so much whether you say it's high, medium, low, is to get you thinking about what evidence you need. And you might want to think about, if you were doing this at your site or a site you know, what evidence would you have to be able to help answer this? Because it's just trying to get you to think about the process rather than the actual answer. Is that clear? So if you go back into your groups, I'll wander around and if the others who are helping earlier on much, if that's very grateful if you could also wander around as well if we get a chance. And we'll answer any questions. And we'll have about 15 minutes or so doing this.